So good morning, good to be with you all. If we haven't met before, I am Catherine. I am one of the pastors of Trinity. Um, and glad to be with you, those of you who are joining us in person and those of you um, who are joining us online as well. We regularly have many people online also, so welcome to you this morning. So for a few weeks, we are taking a look at some of the sayings of Jesus, statements that Jesus made that challenge us and that make us think about what is it that Jesus really wants of me? Last week, Steve talked about a cup of cold water um, that Jesus invites us to give to others and to encourage us to think maybe about just a small thing that we can do that will offer refreshment to others, that, that will um, offer a blessing to them in Jesus' name. And this morning, we're going to take a look at another saying of Jesus. When he is questioned by the religious leaders about who he's hanging out with, he says, healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. What does he mean by that? And what does that mean for us? So we'll begin by taking a look at three different little scenes from the Gospel of Matthew, the ninth chapter. So I invite you to follow along with me. As Jesus continued on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a kiosk for collecting taxes. He said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. As Jesus sat down to eat in Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners joined Jesus and his disciples at the table. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. Go and learn what this means. I want sacrifice. I want mercy and not sacrifice. I didn't come to call righteous people, but sinners. And then we continue with verse 18 and the story of uh, the synagogue ruler's daughter and um, a woman who touched Jesus' clothes. Jesus, while Jesus was speaking to them, a ruler, this is a ruler of the synagogue, knelt down in front of him saying, my daughter has just died, but come and place your hand on her and she'll live. So Jesus and his disciples got up and, and went with him. Then a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years came up behind Jesus and touched the hem of his clothes. She thought, if I only touch his robe, I'll be healed. When Jesus turned and saw her, he said, Be encouraged, daughter. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that time on. When Jesus went into the ruler's house, he saw the flute players and the distressed crowd, the mourners, and he said, go away, because this little girl isn't dead, but is asleep. But they laughed at him. After he had sent the crowd away, Jesus went in and touched her hand. And the little girl rose up. And news about this spread throughout the whole region. This is the word of God for the people of God. And God's people say, thanks be to God. So as I do each week, I invite you to Pray for me in sharing this message with you as I pray for you that, that God, somehow through me, might speak a word that you need to hear today. So let's pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So there was Matthew sitting at his roadside kiosk demanding taxes from all those who went by. 
And those of us who know Bible stories, or maybe even just remember a little bit from vacation Bible school, remember that the tax collectors are the bad guys, right? The tax collectors are the bad guys. A person like Matthew really was just the middleman, not necessarily the bad guy. He was the middleman because he was supposed to be collecting the taxes for the Roman Empire and for Herod Antipas, and they knew that that he would give them the taxes and then he was supposed to skim off of the top of that, charge over and above and skim off of the top to be able to make money for himself. So to the Roman Empire and to Herod Antipas, he, he was just a little guy. And to the Jews in his town and to his family, he was a traitor. He was working for the occupying power, and he wouldn't have been welcome then at any kind of social gatherings in town or even in the synagogue. He would have been a nobody in first century Israel. Yet Jesus said to Matthew, follow me. And he went to the house then of Matthew, and there were many tax collectors there and other sinners, and they all shared a meal together. More nobodies Jesus is associating with. Next, the synagogue ruler comes to Jesus. Jairus is his name, we learn in the Gospel of of Mark and of Luke, Jairus comes to Jesus. He's distraught over the death of his child. Some of you have lost a child. And in my experience as a pastor, that's the most devastating situation that could happen to anyone. But in this first century, the loss of his daughter, that wouldn't necessarily have been the case. You see, because she was female, she had very little value. All females were bought and sold as property. They were really more of a liability than anything else. For several years, he would have to feed and shelter her, and then he would have to pay another man to marry her and take him off her hands. She was really of no consequence and might have even been better off dead. But her father pleaded with Jesus to come and to heal her and to raise her back to life. Now, on his way, Jesus is stopped by another woman reaching out for healing. She'd been hemorrhaging for 12 years. That meant that she was likely unwanted for marriage and unable to have children. And because she had that flow of blood, she would have been considered unclean. And therefore, no one would want to associate with her. She too wouldn't be invited to any social gatherings, and she would definitely not be welcome in the synagogue. How how did she do that? Somehow she slipped through and she touched Jesus' gown. How did she do that unnoticed? Well, maybe it's because she was practically invisible, insignificant, inconsequential to the community. But Jesus encouraged her and said, Woman, your faith has healed you. So then when Jesus finally arrives at the home of Jairus, the mourners and the flute players have already gathered But Jesus went in and touched Jairus' daughter. He touched her hand, and he raised her to new life again. In each of these instances, Jesus reaches out to those who are considered unworthy, inconsequential, nobodies. Each in their own way were cut off from life before Jesus calls out to them, uh, touches them, encourages them. He reaches out and he offers them hope and dignity and community 
again. But from the Pharisees' point of view, Jesus didn't fit their image of a godly person. In their minds, God wants righteous and holy people to um, keep very careful about being separate from the riffraff. The Pharisees sought to establish the boundaries, to, to put up walls, to circle the wagons, if you will. They wanted to avoid the lepers and the bleeding women and the tax collectors and definitely the dead. They defined righteousness in terms of retreat, not reaching out. For the Pharisees, the world was this very neatly organized place according to who was religious and who was irreligious, who were the good guys and who were the bad guys. After all, there's comfort in knowing and clearly defining who are the outsiders because then we can rest assured that we're the insiders, right? If we can define who the bad guys are, then, then clearly we're confident that we're among the good guys. That kind of comparison, us and them, is typically comforting to us. So the religious leaders question Jesus about hanging out with the riffraff. After calling Matthew, Jesus went to Matthew's house and shared a table with even more tax collectors and even more sinners, probably prostitutes as well. How could he share a table and allow himself to be sullied by these unrighteous people? Jesus answers them in, in three ways. First, he responds with the proverb, healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. He points out his saving role, his purpose. His purpose in coming to earth, his purpose as God made flesh, is to touch the diseased, in body, mind, or spirit, and to restore them to well-being and wholeness. He comes knowing that he will be considered sullied when he does this. Second, he quotes the prophet Hosea from Hosea 6.6 and says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. It's that word hesed again. Steve brought it up last week. Hesed, mercy. Not meaning pity, but loving kindness and unconditional love. But why does he talk about sacrifice? Well, he means I desire mercy, not religiosity. I desire mercy, not religious ceremony. Those who are Christ's true followers will be those who are genuinely merciful and who authentically love others. And then finally, he makes a statement about the, the nature of his ministry. He says, I didn't come to save the righteous, but sinners. Now, the familiarity of that saying may, mean, makes it not very startling to us, but again and again in the Old Testament, it says that God loves the righteous and God hates the wicked. So to be told that Jesus' ministry is based on the reverse of that, reaching out to the wicked, well, that would have sounded outrageous to them at that time. So once the tax collector and the woman and the young girl have been restored... They, too, are called to reach out and to bear witness to the kingdom of God. And the same holds true for us. In God's boundless mercy, we, too, have been restored. We have been offered loving kindness. And therefore, we, too, have been called to bear that same witness by reaching out, not retreating, but reaching out to offer love and dignity and well-being to others. It's kind of like the t-shirts that um, we had about a year ago, I think. They said, don't just go to church, be the church. 
Be the church and offer loving kindness to others. Be the church and reach out to those that, that are seen as inconsequential and insignificant and nobodies. Be the church and reach out to those that nobody else seems to care about. Be the church to those who are considered the riffraff. Be the church and reach out to the outsiders. Be the church and invite others to the table, whether it's in the school cafeteria or at the Rotary Luncheon or Wednesday night <clears throat> dinners here at Trinity. The table is where Jesus gathered with the tax collectors and the sinners. And on the night before he was put to death, the table is where he gathered with the disciples, including the riffraff among them, the one disciple who would deny that he even knew Jesus, and the other disciple that would betray him and hand him over to be executed. You know, each week in worship, we come to the table, and pretty much every week we remind the congregation that we celebrate an open table. This table is a foretaste of the heavenly banquet, which is open to everyone. At the table, the youngest child and the most elderly saint are welcome. At the table, those who are still struggling to make sense of everything and those who think they have faith all figured out are welcome. At the table, those who are confident in their faith, those who are exploring, those who are questioning, and even those who are filled with doubt are welcome. Our challenge today is to consider who it is that we personally might not want at the table with us, but we know God is sure to welcome. Who would Jesus be eating with that we might want to exclude? Who are those we see as insignificant, as inconsequential, as nobodies? Who is it that needs to come to the table with the one, the one, who alone can offer healing and restoration to them just as he has offered to us? Think about your own home and your own dinner table. Most of us can say we know someone who's different than we are. We, we, we have friends who are of a different race or ethnicity or sexuality or economic level or, or mental or physical ability. But when was the last time you invited someone into your home to share a meal with you when was the last time you invited someone who was different than you? That's the kind of mercy and action we are called to. That's what it looks like, not just to go to church, but to be the church. There's an old movie that's a favorite of mine. Maybe some of you saw it years ago. It's called Places in the Heart. And Sally Field plays Edna Spaulding. She's a young woman living in Waxahachie, Texas in 1935 in the Great Depression. And she's lost her husband. And in order to save the farm, kind of accumulates a motley crew. She takes in a black handyman and drifter, played by Danny Glover, to help her run the farm. Can you imagine a, a single white woman and two children and a black man running a farm together? And then as if she needs another mouth to feed, she is kind of uh, coerced by the banker into taking in his um, blind brother-in-law so that she can keep the family farm. Now, 
her husband has been killed by a young black man, not intending to kill her husband, the sheriff, um, but wielding a gun that he thought was empty when it wasn't. And then, to the horror of the family, he's brutally attacked and this young black man is brutally attacked and lynched by some people of the town. But what I love about it is that it's a story about a lot of people who are broken and inconsequential and would fit in well with all the tax collectors and sinners. And what I especially love is the scene at the end of the movie. At the very end of the movie, we move into the little Baptist church in town and everyone's sitting in the pews and they're singing in the garden. And as they're singing, communion is being passed and they pass the plate with the bread from person to person, followed by the tray with the little cups filled with juice. And what we realize is that in those pews, they are filled with people who are both the living and the dead, both the saints and the sinners, all who are broken and in need of God's mercy. We, we see the plate pass and it finally gets to Edna's deceased husband and then he passes it next to him to the young man who accidentally took his life. And as he does, he says, peace be with you. That scene in the movie <laughs> is a foretaste of the heavenly banquet. The heavenly banquet where all are welcome, where all of us come as sinners in need of God's mercy. The good and the bad, the righteous and the unrighteous, because Christ is merciful. And we too are called to that mercy. I want to close with the words to a hymn that are probably familiar to many of you. A good call and reminder to us. Come ye sinner, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of mercy love, and power. Come ye thirsty, come and welcome. God's free bounty glorify. True belief and true repentance, every grace that brings you nigh. Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. Come, ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. Thanks be to God for the mercy of Jesus Christ. Amen.